In today's world, we are increasingly dependent on technology. Our business and personal lives rely on it, but as you've probably noticed, it's unreliable. They promise it'll get better, but it usually gets worse. Our computers are slow, so we end up squinting at smartphones and tablets. We live in constant fear that something's going to happen to our personal data. So we're scared into paying for fake protection that proves useless when disaster strikes. Update attacks, fake Wi-Fi, cloud control, and other industry scandals are designed to keep the money flowing. The jokers we pay to fix our stuff have no clue what they're doing, so they do a virus scan and then wipe out our precious photos. Intelligent, successful people feel intimidated by the chaos and think it's somehow their fault. If they only knew what the industry was doing to them, they'd get torches and pitchforks. If only we had someone to explain it all in plain English so we can start protecting ourselves. Oh wait, we do! It's the Computer Exorcist Podcast with your host, Mark Anthony Arena. From the Wallace Memorial microphone in my home office, overlooking the can of worms in downtown Rochester, New York, this is the Computer Exorcist Podcast. I am so happy you are joining me today, as always. And today, as always, we have another fascinating special guest. I apologize to y'all for taking this long to get him on the show. I've known him since probably 2018 or so. He heard me on a Pittsburgh talk show, and at the time, I was deep in the depths of my life, my extremely busy period of my career, wondering if I'm the only guy out there who knows right from wrong in this industry. Wondering if I'm the only guy out there who isn't out to rip people off. And wondering if I'm the only guy out there who, even if a lot of dudes are in, mean well, a lot of dudes use ancient methods. And I always wondered, am I, am I the only guy out there who knows better and who knows the proper methods and who knows about ethics and who knows how to take care of people and is personable? And Out of the blue, I get a phone call. And this guy named Mike calls me from L.A., and he heard me on a Pittsburgh talk show. And the show was the Jim Quinn show, and he's Jim is an absolute genius. And he mentions me on his show sometimes. He interviewed me once. So this guy Mike calls and says, Hi, I do what you do. I've been doing it longer than you have, and I agree with you on almost everything. And I, I just... I just thank God whenever I get calls like this. So his was the first call like that. I'm so encouraged to know he exists. I think y'all are going to like him. And Mike, tell us about yourself and your company and how you got here. All right, Mark, how are you today? I'm glad to talk to you finally. How's my audio? Uh, coming in great. Great. Uh, well, I started my company back in about 1997, and I came from the office equipment field. Uh, and the way I started was, uh, was was this. I'd be working in an office on a copier, fax machine, laser printer. And uh, I said, uh, hey, Mary, how's that computer treating you? And she said, oh, this old thing, it's been so slow. I, I, wish, I wish somebody could fix it. I'll tell you what, ask your boss if he'll pay me 50 bucks. I'm going to lunch here in a half hour, and I'll fix it for you. And I parlayed that into several other clients. My current employer wow. at the time did it all. So that, then I built the business MacGyver Technologies, and uh, I've been going strong ever since 97. And it's a kind of a take on the name MacGyver, like the TV show, but not really. It's spelled differently. It's M-C-G-Y-V-E-R. And what that means is my company gives you very excellent results. Oh, I love that. And, and the MacGyver imagery, I love that too. And that's why I changed my name to Computer Exorcist. The imagery of I'm here to exercise the demons and you're here to be a MacGyver to solve anything in a creative way, right? Fix anything that's broken. Anything that's broken. If, if, it's, if, if, it's, if it's technology and you can't figure it out, just call me. I'll be your, um, as, as, as I say, I'm, I'm your, like your digital Sherpa. 
guiding you across the mountains of this crazy world we live in. And uh, as we hold hands and merrily script through the minefield of technology. The digital Sherpa, the minefield of technology. This guy's good. Like, you have the imagery, the stuff that I do on my show. Like, I do this. I, I love it. I love it. You, you get it and you use the same kind of imagery to describe the preposterous nature of what this is. Yes, and the difference between me and you is you expect this stuff to work. I tell this to my clients all the time. Right. I always get real charge out of that because it's true. They want to turn a switch and have a light come on. But right. what really happens with technology is you turn a switch and that tells the computer to t turn the light on. And there's a thousand things that have to happen in the right order mm -hmm. to work. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, it's funny, like you go to the store and these jokers there, even the repair jokers, they go, oh, well, you just you just install it. I mean, what do you mean you just install it? I say, you have to fight and wrestle with it. Nothing ever works. So I always quote you on that. And when when you say the difference between you and me is you expect the stuff to work. Even tonight, I was folks, I was trying to text him. And yesterday I was trying to text him and it just never came through. And usually texting is reliable where I, I'm I, I rely on it. But Mike reminded me, hey, Mark, you expect this thing to work? So he didn't receive any of my texts. And until a few moments ago, the nail came in in a flurry. Oh, hysterical. Um, so it just, it just baffles me that, that lest I think that any of this stuff works, here we go. It doesn't work, you know. And and again, Mike, you and I always use what I here's here's what I say, and and I want to know if you say this one as well. I always tell people, look, I recommend the least bad stuff. I recommend the least unreliable stuff. There's no good stuff, but it's like here's the least bad brands. Yes, exactly. For example, HP, worst computers loaded with the most corporate malware. Um, the cheapest, thinnest metal for the case, and then you have to go toward like Lenovo or get, get a much better product. Thank you, thank you. My folks know I say it all the time, my listeners, my clients. So folks, here you go, it's not just me, MacGyver Tech agrees. And that's why I was so thrilled to meet this guy. He just he just gets it. And and I knew when people say, Mark, are you really the only guy in the world? And I say, look, I, I know I'm not the only guy in the world. There's a handful of guys out there. Okay. When Oftentimes, I'll go to a client's home or office, and they will look at me and ask me the inevitable question, gee, Mike, what kind of antivirus software should I use? And I smile and lean back and say, well, I'm a bit of a heretic on this. And then I explain to them the three true threats of, of their computer. And the first is corporate malware. You buy that new machine, it's loaded with all of this software uh, to, to sell you ink, to uh, get you to go into their app store and buy their products, um, to buy their, their antivirus software, which doesn't work. It slows you down, spies you on you. Nicely. And the second threat is that phone call you get. Hello, my name is Bob. I'm from Microsoft. Now, let me tell you, I have a client that's a former Los Angeles County Sheriff's detective. Huh. He, got, oh, he picked huh. it up. He had his credit card in his hand. Uh. This is with him. He let them into his computer. The last minute, he said, oh, this doesn't sound right, hung up and called me. It took me two hours to get the <laughs> out of his computer they put into it. Now, if a former Los Angeles County Sheriff's detective fall for it, you can too. Yep, and and like I I can't believe just how thrilled I am to hear you say because I had a lady this morning. I mean, every day people ask me that question: What kind of antivirus? And I had a lady. I was in a meeting this morning, and she said, "What kind of antivirus do I use?" And I say, "It doesn't matter because antivirus can't protect you against anything besides bubonic plague, right? Ancient threats." I said, "What would you take medicine today to protect against bubonic plague? No, it's a waste of your time." So I'm so thrilled to know that you say the same thing. Viruses don't happen. There's three new threats out there. So you got the corporate malware, you got the scary phone calls, and by the way, same deal, all my clients are intelligent, successful people, so don't feel bad, right? I have doctors, lawyers, and you have, you have uh, police investigators, right? He's no dummy. All this stuff gets everybody because we're all scared. What's, so you're right on the money. Uh, what was your third threat you tell people about? third threat is that scary text or email. I had another guy, it's about, about a year or two ago, and he got a, a, an email from 
from Amazon that said, your Amazon account has been compromised. Click here to resolve it. You know, he yep. was smart. He went to the Google. And Google told him when he typed in uh, Amazon support phone number. Ah! Very mm -hmm. first up was a scam. Right. He called. He let them into his computer. He logged into his Amazon account. And then what happened, Mark? They blacked his screen out and ordered thousands of dollars in Amazon gift cards. Brilliant. Yep. So then he because he remembered MacGyver Technologies. I always have a sticker that they put on their computer. Yep. My name is on it. So he called me out, and I went to startpage.com, the world's most private search engine. Mm -hmm. And I typed the same search query, Amazon support phone number. And the first one that came up was the Amazon support phone number. So I called that, and he says, oh, my God, we get, we get this all the time. So give me some information. Go ahead and log in. They corrected the problem in 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's so I you know you had your threat number two and threat number three. I consider the same thing. I call them support scams, but I do explain to people there's a couple different ways you can get scammed by these guys. Um, but you're just spot on. I get the same call every day, right? I went on the Googles and I typed in Amazon help, and and most of the time people aren't even using the Googles. They they've been hijacked by the Maps Galaxy or they've been hijacked by Bing or whatever. But, but yeah, it's absolutely everyone on this planet. And of course, the bad guys know that gift cards are totally untraceable, right? We live in this ultra complex world where everything is traceable except for gift cards because why would anyone want to save your $10,000, right? Why would anyone want that? So, what's uh, your third threat? So, my third threat is ransomware, right? Where it scrambles, it breaks in like a hot knife through butter in any Microsoft computer, scrambles all your documents, begs you for zillions of dollars, right? And the only way to protect against that is proper backup. And then my fourth threat is update attacks, which can never protect and only destroy. Right, right, right. Hey, side note today, uh, this week, I had a guy. And he says, Mark, I got an email from PayPal, and they said blah, 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 and I owe millions of dollars, and I should call this number. So, of course, he did. So I look oh, no. at the <clears throat> right. So I look at the email, and again, this guy's a really intelligent guy. And so I look at the email, and I said, wait a minute. This came from PayPal. All right, you ready for this brand new threat this week? Oh, what? The bad guys create a real PayPal account. And they send you a real PayPal invoice, so it shows up in your inbox as a real PayPal invoice from real PayPal. Uh -huh. Then in the comments section, you know, it's an invoice, it's just a request for money. At that point, they haven't taken anything, okay? So they'll request some random amount of money. And then in the comments section, normally you and I would put in the comments like, Hey, thanks, client. Have a great day. Thanks for your business, right? So the bad guys go in the comments section and they say, congratulations, you just spent three grand on something. Please call our phone number if you have a problem. Okay. Isn't that sinister? And that's it? That's the whole scam and everyone's falling for it. Because it comes from real PayPal. It's just a comment. It's just a sentence. Right. Interesting. Well, I always instruct my clients to mouse over or put the mouse cursor over the sending email or whatever to find out if it's the correct in other words the, the place that they're actually sending from is not uh, japan.ts dot you know uh, who knows what right betty yeah. sue at gmail or whatever right but that's the thing mike with this week's version of the scam they send it from real paypal Oh, they're diabolical, right. aren't they? It's a true invoice from another PayPal member, but that PayPal member is actually an evil person who puts a scary sentence in the comment line of his real PayPal invoice. Hmm. Well, people have to have more street smarts than book smarts. And, and again, I tell my elderly folks, hey folks, you've got something that no one else has, and that's wisdom. So elderly folks out there, just remember, don't call anyone. Yeah, I often tell my clients the same kind of thing. Just because you're sitting in your pajamas in your house with a cup of coffee in your hand doesn't mean you're safe when you're in front of your computer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you've got like you get it. You get it. and and I'm going to let you talk for a minute cuz I'm just I'm just so excited, but but just tell me more about how you got into it and and just things you've seen. 
Well, I've been working with computers since 1979. My first computer was a uh, Candy Radio Shack Tierra set. He's actually the school's computer. Yep. And then um, some time passed, and I was uh, riding my my bike on a not quite completed bike trail in like 1983 or four, maybe 82, and uh, the bike went off the edge of a of a, of a, a concrete area, and I broke my collarbone. So mm. I, I took work and i'm sitting there in the front room and as my roommate is going going to work he says you know you really can't do a whole lot would you like to play with this texas instruments ti 99.4a and i said sure so i fiddled with that for a while and and eventually moved onto atari and of course i had pcs and macs and all that stuff so i kind of uh sidled into this and i've always been in the field service and one of the things that i've noticed most particularly with with IT people, computer people, is they do not know how to communicate an idea to a client or a Thank human you. being. Thank you. They don't tell stories. They don't try to ingratiate themselves and go. You know what? I understand where you're coming from. I've been there too. And here's what I did. And here's the mistake that I made. And I'm going to make sure you don't make this same mistake. So join with me on a journey. I'll tell you a story, and we'll fix this problem together. What do you think about that? And so they kind of like that approach. They feel like you know. You're standing with them, looking at the technology, going, that's the enemy over there. Let's let's, let's conquer it. So um, one thing that's really important is all of your listeners need to understand is never let a computer make you think you're stupid. Right. Right. All my people, intelligent, successful people, don't let it intimidate you and don't let a dude intimidate you either. Exactly. So being able to communicate a simple idea in, in you know, common parlance so that any understand it is key to any job but particularly in, in in this field because people are really really terrified of this technology even as easy as it is to use today that's the word that's the word i say that word all the time they're terrified by it and it's and it's even if the designers aren't demons as i accuse them of being um they still are folks who love complexity and they think that slathering more complexity is going to help somebody mm-hmm Correct, yes. It used wow. to be the case. Now, Apple, I do like a, a lot of things about Apple, particularly in the older days. They have a human interface design team. Uh-huh. And their job to make the com- you conform to the computer, but make the computer more human-like and more in an environment that makes sense to a normal person, like the desktop metaphor hmm. and the metaphor. But as time has marched on, things have things have deviated from that in such a way that any more, you know, what is a hamburger menu? Tell me what a hamburger menu is, Mark. Right, it's just three lines on the top right corner, and they kind of resemble a hamburger because they don't resemble anything else, so someone had to make up that descriptor, right? It's And do you remember how Apple decided a couple of years ago that they were going to deprecate skewomorphs? Skewomorphs? Yes. Skew, I'll let you finish your thought, and then I'll go to mine. Oh, yeah, that's what I was saying. That's why I served in the hamburger menu thing, because because it's getting to the point, you know, we progressed all the way from hieroglyphics through cuneiform and then, then into Latin and English and all the romantic languages, and now we're going right back to hieroglyphs. Everything is a pictogram. Oh, that's amazing. i got to write that down. That's such a great observation. We're going right, we are, we're going right back to hieroglyphs. Yep, hieroglyphs, uh, emojis, uh, yeah. you've got gear menus, uh, I, the three dot ellipses, the hamburger menu, and other things that I, I can see. I, I know that's a control for something, and I'm in the business. I don't know what to call it. So just click on that funny thing in the upper right-hand corner. <laughs> yeah, I actually resort to calling things secrets. I'm like, click tiny stupid arrow or click secret three dot menu because it's yeah. all ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Exactly. It really is. Um, so skewomorphs, the idea, and I did an episode of this a while back, skewomorphs are the idea that an icon should be, like you said, a metaphor, right? Your desktop on your computer is a metaphor for your actual desk. So a skewomorph could be when you're on your cell phone and you want to answer a call, right? When you answer a call, there's a green button that has a little shape of a rotary phone handset. 
Right. Unfortunately, we don't use those anymore. I wish we did. But it's a skeuomorph. It's an icon that represents something, right? So same thing with the save button on a word processor. It's a floppy disk. To this day, that save icon is a floppy disk because it means something and it has meaning. And I love how kids will look at a floppy disk nowadays and they'll say, oh, look, it's a real life save icon. <laughs> <laughs> But the point is, we need those. And Apple decided to deprecate or to retire all of those because shame on you, you should get with the program now and worship the future. So now they make these abstract symbols that are nonsensical and have no meaning, right? Skewomorphs, right, they, they, they evolved, right? They had meaning. Even if you didn't use them physically, they still represented something concrete to people and they're trying to get rid of them. Okay, can you give me an example of a deprecated skill morph? Mm, I'd have to think of this. Yeah, tough question. Yeah, probably with... I mean, the hamburger menu would be a good example in a way because it's a nonsensical uh -huh. symbol, uh, but I'll think on that. Yeah, I think the hamburger menu is a truncated version of a list, a lined list. Okay, all right. When you click it, I usually what what falls down a lined list, a drop down menu. Yeah, that's correct. So that's ah, uh, I'm pulling up a piece of software on my computer right now, and assuming it doesn't crash the whole thing, I'm gonna see if there are any deprecated skeuomorphs. <laughs> how do you spell that, by the way? Skeuomorph. I know how to spell morph. S K E U O and then morph. M O R P H. Uh. Yeah, look it up. It's a fascinating thing. All right, I'm looking at the, I mean, the printer icon, that still makes sense because it kind of resembles a printer. The folder is another skeuomorph, right? It represents a folder in reality here. Correct, but I cannot directly think of any skeuomorph that uh, fits your description. All right, I'm looking on the the interwebs right now, and let's see here. Uh, for example, the download icon is still basically an arrow pointing into a box. Yeah, that's correct. And so nowadays it's like a cloud pointing downward. And that's still some good symbolism here. All right. Uh, well, I'll tell you one. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. So uh, actually, actually, there's two of them I'll give you. Number one, in Windows, right, in Microsoft Windows, you had a button, right? Since Windows 3.0 and 3.1 you would have an OK and a cancel, and they would resemble a button, right? It was really simple. They used a little bit of artwork, a little bit of shading on the bottom edges, so they looked like a button. It looked like a 3D like, button, right? Right. And you'd click your mouse, and it would press, and it would even physically press it so it would appear as though you're pressing it. Okay, great. They replaced that in Windows 10 and 11 by these evil squares that have no real visible border, so you're not sure if it's a button anymore, and too bad for you. Yes. Yeah. And same thing with iTunes. Uh, the Apple iTunes software used to be an icon of a CD and a music note. And right. recently they deprecated the CD icon because shame on you. You should stop using that because it's old. So now it's just a music note. Right. And another thing that kills me is the low contrast features mm -hmm. on uh, of these interfaces where you can't quite tell if that button is highlighted. Is, is, that, is that the default button now? It's darker right. gray button? Unfortunately, some of that, I mean, some of it is just unintentional, right? It's just sloppy, but some of it is intentional. It's called dark manipulation, where they want you to think it's not available. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, so well, they're... they're full of uh, software engineers with nothing to do, so when they get it perfect, they have to screw it up for a time, so you then begin to want it perfect again, and then keep the engineers employed. Thank you. Yet another thing you say that I say all the time. I am so glad you exist. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you too, Mark. Well, <laughs> sometime I'll come up there to uh, New York and, and Radley or Cage. We'll go have some break, break, break bed together. Yeah, I will. Uh, if if you're bored, check out my podcast. Uh, another podcast I do called Flyover Plates, where I talk about this cuisine called the Garbage Plate. Okay. It's it's a trip. It's my buddy does it. I'm the co-host, and we just he sends me to to stuff my face with very unhealthy foods, and then I report back to him. Oh, wow, uh, well, some of them, I wouldn't want to eat it all the time, though. Right. Yeah. Uh, 
and it's 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 a great oh yeah so oh what was oh and you know the other thing is you were saying how you broke your collarbone but it, it brought that great serendipitous discovery in your life and same thing happened my grandpa was in a motorcycle accident and that's how he met my grandma and but i'm thinking like i broke my elbow a couple months ago and i didn't get anything out of it <laughs> you've already got a career are you married <laughs> no so maybe i'll get that maybe <laughs> so all right i'm gonna read an article if you're ready and what we'll do actually i'll read the article and then we will it's up to you we could take a break at the half hour and then do a, a part two um let's see how we go shall we go ahead blacklistednews.com and this comes this article comes thanks to you you emailed me this three years ago so thanks to mike cowan from macgyver tech um blacklistednews.com your car is spying on you and a cbp contract shows the risks uh, this is from 2021. U.S. Customs and Border Protection purchase technology that vacuums up reams of personal information stored inside cars, according to The Intercept. Um, and The Intercept by Latinx advocacy organization Mi Gente, and they spelled Mi Gente wrong, um, shows that CBP paid uh, Swedish data extraction firm MSAB uh, half a million for the IVE vehicle forensics kits manufactured by Birla, an American company. So that's kind of a roundabout thing, right? The American company makes it, they sell it to a Swedish company, Swedish company sells it to CBP. Maybe CBP didn't realize they could buy it locally and whatever, right? So mm-hmm. pretty inefficient. Uh, it can provide evidence regarding the vehicle's use, but also information through the mobile devices paired with your infotainment system. According to Berla's own founder, part of the draw of vacuuming data out of cars is that so many drivers are oblivious to the fact that their cars are generating so much data in the first place, often including extremely sensitive information inadvertently synced from smartphones. Okay, so let's let's summarize this for a second here. <sighs> Y'all don't know that when you plug your smartphones into these new evil iPad things, these tablet dashboard things in your car, first of all, y'all don't know how much information your car is recording about you. Your speeds, when and where and how often you're speeding. And then when you plug your phone in, it sucks your call history, your contacts, your text messages. It sucks all sorts of things. And I always say at the beginning of the show... Rebecca says, if people knew what was happening to them, they would get torches and pitchforks. Correct. You see, your your, your automobile used to be a bastion of privacy and freedom. Freedom. Drive anywhere at a moment's notice, so long as we could afford the car and the gas to put in it. And we were living in a cocoon, a bubble of privacy. All we had was our AM radio our cassette deck, and uh, that was it. And then along comes the cell phone, and it was a miracle. You could drive down the road and talk on the phone. Mm-hmm. And, and then cars became integrated via Bluetooth and other technology. Now, now you have basically a spy device that's got an accelerometer in it. It's got a GPS in it, and your car has the same thing with the OnStar and what have you. And mm-hmm. now it's a, a spy box. It tells everything about your eye movements, your head movements, how hard you take corners, how f- quickly you decelerate, how fast you accelerate, how fast you're driving, and you, you plug the phone in, and suddenly you've got 10,000 contacts stored in the freaking car. Now, if this is a rental car, when right. you turn the car in, do you wipe all that data? I know. I, ha- I haven't done it. So what happens to that data? It goes somewhere. Anytime you go to a website and you cannot figure out what they're selling, you are the product. They're Uh, selling you. Right, like Facebook, for example, or Google, right? It's free and it gives you all this lovely stuff, but guess what? You're the product, right? Soylent green. Exactly. It's people. So (laughs) when when uh, once the data leaves your phone, it's now marketable. It's now it's now a commodity. Old in the open market. In fact, uh, I, I, I've heard recordings of 
of women that are young ladies that have, have gotten their insurance. They got a great deal of insurance and they sign up for this app for their insurance company. And lo and behold, six months later, their premiums go up 30 percent and yep. they can't fix it. Well, the reason is, my dear, because that app that you downloaded is telling the insurance company how fast you're driving, how long you're yep. driving what you're in the car and whether or not you're paying attention. <laughs> and and that's that's I mean, first of all, Mike, as usual, you're saying everything like I don't need to talk anymore because you're saying everything I'm thinking. So that's amazing. But the oh, so many things. Number one. Yeah, you know, the AM radio in the car and the original cars, right? It was a mechanical thing. It didn't report anything. It didn't transmit anything. It just received and, and it gave you freedom. And that was and that's why I was obsessed with cars as a teenager and, and through all throughout my life since then uh, because of the freedom. But but you're right. It's, it's the classic thing that I talk about on the show that technology is great but people end up using it for evil because some sports bro somewhere is sitting at a sports bar trying to figure out how he can milk people for recurring revenue and and i just like i said recently in the in the episode about the virtual power plant scandal where they're dangling pennies in front of you there is uh, a couple there are a couple insurance companies that have a little thing that you plug into your car and it, oh, we're gonna give you a few pennies discount for being a good driver, right? So people are falling for the pennies, right? You dangle the penny like a fish hook, and everyone falls for it. Now all of a sudden, uh, they're recording, like you were saying, how hard you're cornering. And the newer cars, like the Mercedes S Class, I believe, they they shame you and they say shame on you. Your eye movement's a little erratic. Why don't you pull over and have a coffee? Yeah, exactly. Actually, I was my dad and I rented a Ford Expedition. Uh, right before we go to break, I'll just give you this little story. We rented this Ford Expedition. I was very impressed with the car. Very, very nice vehicle. Big but easy to drive. Very luxurious. I would buy one. It's nice. But So my dad's driving first, right? We're taking turns driving. We're driving all the way down to Carolina. So he gets in the car. And we're fresh. We we just woke up. We're ready to go on our trip. And the car starts shaming him. And it says, shame on you. You you need to pull over and have a rest. What's your problem? Who do you think you are? That kind of thing. So he's like, oh, that's funny. And I said, we, we just started driving. We were only driving maybe, what, an hour? And then I got in the car and it never did it. It never complained. Then my dad gets back in the car and it starts punishing him. So, again, y'all don't know that when you have an evil computer it's not a real human so it doesn't know it doesn't know reality it doesn't know that you're tired so it uses evil metrics to measure you so what it was doing it doesn't actually know if you're tired this vehicle judged us based on how erratically my dad was driving and he's an excellent driver but he's very aggressive so okay. it accused him of being tired when in reality he's just very aggressive and i, I just i teased him the whole way down i gotta say because <laughs> it was yelling at him telling him to go take a nap and it was fine with me that's funny uh, i'm always a kid of that very prescient movie demolition man with sylvester salone john spartan you've been fined 13 credits and all he was doing was cursing are we coming to that right and remember the bruce willis in the fifth element where he lit up a cigarette and this little drone was following him and punished him yes yeah it's it, i call it micro control Right? It's like microaggressions, but it's Silicon Valley controlling us in little tiny ways and, and death by a thousand needles. Yes, not, not because they should, but because they can. Again, they yep. Control for you, they will always utilize and exercise control to limit your freedom. It, I don't like every episode on this show, Mike, you read my mind. All I say every episode is they do it because they can and not because they should we're gonna take a break here we're gonna come back for join us for part two and uh, stay tuned for the rest of our interview with mike from macgyver technologies thank you so much for being here buy my book for everyone you know thecomputerexorcist.com and what is your site mike it's macgyvertech.com m-c-g-y-v-e-r-t-e-c-h.com and what does that stand for again my company gives you very excellent results. That's so cool. We'll be right well, back. They, mm -hmm. they don't remember Mike, but they never forget MacGyver. <laughs> Love it. 
Show.